Hi, good evening. Uh, welcome to the fourth edition of the Heartbeat Run uh, series of talks. We call it the Hearty Talks. <laughs> and uh, this is always done on the last Tuesday, but today we have to delay because of internal logistics challenges to the Wednesday. And uh, this, the purpose of Heartbeat Run is to focus on running as a measure to beat cardiac disease. For those who don't know, and especially for those who are so much amazed with COVID and you know all the things that we're doing for COVID, our view is that there is about 1.8 million, that is 18 lakh people have died last year in our country because of heart disease. 80,000 people die in Bombay every single day because of heart disease, okay? While, get this, the entire COVID thing in our country has killed about 1 lakh 20. I'm not, I, I mourn for those deaths, okay? But if you look at the ratio, it's about one is to ten, and uh, and heart disease is like like the elephant in the room of public health, which nobody talks about. And the purpose of Heartbeat Run and you two can run is to focus on heart disease and how to prevent heart disease, bring down the public health statistics. So the series of webinars is meant to focus on you know several uh, several aspects of of uh, of running and cardiac disease. Uh, this is brought to you by you can run for those who don't know us we have been around the block a few times we are one of the biggest uh, sports management companies in the in the field of running for totally focused on running now we are starting cycling we do races that is we do registration for events we do race management which means we do the complete event we have corporate wellness programs we do training we do virtual events virtual challenges we have a shop where we can list products and we can buy products from, which are all curated for you know running health and fitness. Uh, we have a we have a calendar where you know all running events are listed. So that is the bouquet of offerings that we have. We try to be a one-stop shop for everything in running. Today we have uh, Dr. Christopher Petra from uh, Sir Reliance H and Hospital. Uh, they are our uh, they are our medical partners in this uh, feature heartbeat run. And uh, welcome to the show, Dr. Christopher. Thanks for that. Really? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Christopher is an MPhil in sports science. Uh, he has had about, I think, about 10 years of experience with uh, Tim Noakes in South Africa, who's like the legendary Tim Noakes, the written the Bible. Anybody who's like a keen runner should know uh, the lore of running, which is the best compendium of scientific research on running in the in the world. And uh, also been the medical director of Comrades, for those who know Comrades for number of years and Chris has worked with him then he came back he came down to India and he was practicing on his own and now he's part of the team at Sir HN Reliance and Chris works with uh, Olympic athletes in India uh, tennis players cricket professionals uh, welcome to the show Chris good to be here Venkat thanks for having me thank you so Chris what are the kind of athletes that you work with are there any big names that you can quote cite uh, yeah, I prefer to not mention any names, but um, some of the top badminton guys I've been uh, very fortunate enough to work with. So, mm -hmm. um, Commonwealth Games and Olympic medal winners. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the cricketers, obviously, uh, India's got plenty enough of those. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, India's, India's on a big push at the moment for the Olympic sports. Um, mm -hmm. So, things like weightlifting. Um, you know, shooting, uh, so different different kinds of uh, activities than you know I was I was seeing predominantly in South Africa more sort of mm. team sport players, rugby, cricket, mm. football. Mm. Uh, whereas uh, it's it's probably predominantly more individual athletes. Mm. Very good. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> what what is your area of practice? It's more of uh, sport science, exercise physiology. Strength and yeah. So probably I know a combination. You're not even going yeah. to go into that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So look, I suppose it's probably a combination of of everything is the approach that I try to take, and I think probably most most people working in elite sports nowadays are are not just one thing. They don't just wear one hat, so to speak. Um, you need to have an understanding at least of of everything that's on offer. Um, and particularly being a physio uh, who travels with athletes, you have to have quite an in-depth understanding of a lot of things. You need to have um, a relatively strong strength and conditioning aspect to your approach. 
you need to understand exercise physiology if you're trying to plan programs for people, um, if you're trying to advise people on how to train, how to get back to sports after injury. Um, and then obviously, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're medically trained, so we've got a fair medical background as well um, for, for in case things go pear shaped um, But more, you know, we, 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 we'd like to use it more just to advise people um, on who the right person to go and see is in, in case there is a medical situation going on. Excellent, excellent. So, uh, Doctor, coming back to the topic, uh, you know that... Uh, the COVID has brought about the extreme need for people to take up running. COVID has also highlighted to the general populace that heart disease is an existing comorbidity. Heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, all these are existing. They're the triage of you know, Ill, you know, lifestyle diseases. And they are a uh, uh, high risk for, uh, for COVID patients. Now, whether a person has had a heart disease or not, or a incident, cardiac incident or not, many of them want to start running. Now, this is all right if the guy doesn't have any history, probably just starts running and doesn't do any evaluation, etc. But there are many who have had cardiac incidences. And this could be things like, you know, maybe a mild cardiac arrest, maybe a coronary you know, bypass surgery, maybe an angioplasty, maybe pacemaker, maybe wall replacement, you know, any one of this. And uh, almost all of them want to come back to running. And uh, they want to do it cautiously, obviously, you know, nobody wants to take a risk and their families are concerned and they don't want them to go out and do something stupid over there. So specifically, cardiac patients with cardiac history, cardiac incident, cardiac risk, let's even put it that way, let's broaden the ambit a bit to somebody who's like 50 plus, you know, on statins, cholesterol, uh, hasn't done a stress to the echo, but you never know, it might turn out to be positive if the guy went on the treadmill. You know, what, 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 what can those kind of people start running? Should, what would be your first cut advice? Should they start running? What are the conditions under which they can start running? What are the conditions under which they should not consider running? Doctor, you've got a presentation. Shall I pull up the presentation and share it? Yeah, yeah, I think so. It might, it might help to guide, um, guide the process. Just one minute. There you go. I just increase the size, yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> your your first question about whether cardiac patients can start running, um, I think you mentioned a number of different um, you know uh, situations in which somebody might find themselves being a cardiac patient or a so-called cardiac patient. Um, you mentioned cardiac arrest, uh, which I think we should maybe just go through a couple of the terms uh, just so that people understand. Uh, you know, there are different. There are different um, levels to this kind of uh, classification or this kind of um, you know category of, of patients. Um, so your cardiac cardiac arrest is is when your heart either stops beating or it's beating abnormally. Um, now that could be due to coronary artery disease, which is primarily the the main reason. Um, but the the important thing here is that you would require urgent medical care. Um, and that urgent medical care may take the form of, you know, CPR, um, defibrillation, hospitalization, uh, medication, <clears throat> potentially surgery. There are a number of things that could happen. Um, an angioplasty, uh, you mentioned, um, or they could put a stent into your, into your cardiac arteries or one of your cardiac arteries or more. Um, that's effectively when they go in and they, they sort of stick a, a small tube inside. And that's the 
tune and then replace the stent to widen the artery so that you can increase blood flow to the heart muscles. Um, cardioversion is something that happens typically when people have arrhythmias. So when their heart doesn't beat like the doop 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 like we're all used to, maybe it goes da -da 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 -da. there's a little bit of fibrillation maybe or something different like that. Some runners with cardiac issues may actually um, experience that. Uh, while running and that's that's basically effectively when they shock your heart back into rhythm um, often after that you might require a pacemaker so some runners out there might have pacemakers and the pacemaker basically just controls any abnormal uh, heart rhythm um, and then you can also potentially have a valve replacement um, so this could either be just you know years and years worth of your valve maybe not um, not performing very well uh, it could be a completely incidental finding in an athlete um, or it could be something that you picked up because you've had symptoms um, and then in that case they, they replace one of the valves now the point I want to go the points I'm getting to with all of these different things is that you know a cardiac patient isn't just a cardiac patient there, there's certainly different levels of it and somebody who's potentially just had a pacemaker fitted or somebody who's gone through cardioversion uh, would probably not require the cardiac rehab that uh, somebody who's had a cardiac uh, cardiac arrest or cardiac um, artery bypass grafts uh, surgery you know there's there, there's a different a different level to that so um, <clears throat> if we move on to the the next slide um, sure. we know we know that um, you know activity thing for us okay um, so everybody knows this and you guys you know that's effectively what what your whole um, you know, process is, is based on and built on is, is the fact that we want people to be more active because we want to bring these numbers of people with cardiac artery disease down. We don't want these cardiac events. Um, and we know that activity um, decreases the risk of developing these things. Uh, similarly, or conversely, inactivity is a risk factor. So we want people to be active. Um, but once people are stable, Either on or off medication. After they've had one of these uh, one of these issues that we discussed in the previous slide, um, they would need to be assessed by a relevant professional. Um, so they would be under the care of a cardiologist if they were in hospital um, or a, or a, a, a medical physician. Um, beyond that, once they are uh, discharged and they are you know cleared for activity, let's say they. Would wouldn't be cleared to start running immediately. They might be cleared to do, you know, very light housework, um, maybe to enter a cardiac rehab program. Now, that cardiac rehab program is run typically by physios or maybe exercise physiologists. Um, I don't, I don't do a lot of that myself. I'm sort of at the at the, the sort of more progressive end when people are returning to sports and performance. Um, but the cardiac rehab program is is imperative. It's really critical in this whole process because. It's effectively what, you know, it's the initial screening um, that allows allows you sort of, or allows your provider decide where you can start and what sort of activity levels and intensities you can start with. Uh, so it's a very, very important process that you go through. It's not as easy as, you know, just typing your symptoms or your, uh, you know, two weeks after a, a heart attack, can I run? Uh, you know, there's, there's, you know, you would know this. There's a very specific process to go through. Um, so the screening that that would involve typically a stress test, um, and then also just asking patients about their symptoms. Um, and the the symptoms are a really important one, and we'll go, we'll come to it later on again. It's the symptoms are a really important thing to continue to monitor throughout your journey from you know discharge to getting back to running your 21s or 42s or whatever it is that you want to get to. If you can get there, some people might be advised not to go that route or might, might not be advised to go that intense. Um, but for the most part, you know, there are in fact loads of athletes running around with cardiac uh, issues that they don't even know about and that they, they pick up incidentally. So, you know, it's not, a, it's not necessarily a life sentence that you cannot do this if you've had a cardiac problem, but we just, for each person, it, it depends really. We need to find a way to, for it to happen, you know? Um, so your, your common abnormal symptoms would include things like you might experience during a cardiac event, uh, chest pain, shortness of breath, fainting, dizziness, uh, fatigue using that RPE scale will come to a little bit later, and then even something like nausea, and then uh, abnormal heart rhythms as well. 
Um, so recommending whether people are eligible for sport, once you've got to that stage and you've got to this cardiac rehab program and you're either in the door, out the door, if you're very low risk or you're higher risk, um, it depends on the presence of, of a lot of these symptoms. Uh, so do you get exercise induced exercise induced myocardial ischemia. So that might present as either chest pain or shortness of breath uh, or one of those things, fatigue. Uh, do you get arrhythmias? Does your heartbeat change very, you know, erratically during exercise? This would be a warning sign as well. Um, what sort of level of competition are you trying to get back to? Are you an Olympic athlete? Are you a Premier League footballer? Um, you know, those kind of things might not be possible. Uh, but are you just a social runner who wants to do his, you know, 40, 50, 60 Ks a week um, at, a, at a moderate pace, um, you know, and you've been running for a long time. These are all factors that we need to think of. Um, the important thing is that this whole process needs to be very gradual and very comfortable. So subjective feedback is super, super important. You know, obviously in the early in the early stages when you're in hospital, they're checking your your markers for cardiovascular stress. You know, blood tests, things like that. They've got you strapped up to uh, or wired up to ECGs. If you undergo a stress test, there's a lot of information that they're getting from these things. Um, but once you're out on the road or, or once you've sort of left the hospital, a lot of it comes back to you actually feeding back and responding with your symptoms. Um, so it needs to be comfortable. You know, whether you're starting to walk inside the cardiac rehab department and you're just doing, you know, three, three, three minute sets of walking slowly or you're getting out onto the road for the first time and you're trying your first five minute jog, um, <clears throat> it needs to be very comfortable. Uh, so you should never be uncomfortable exercising. That's a really important thing, a really important point to stress. Um, and then uh, also understanding that, you know, having had something happening with your heart because your heart is is so central to the um, the endurance activity process, process and and and, um, and and fitness aspects of it. You have to keep having reevaluations done. Uh, there's there's very little, um, I suppose. Uh, uh, there's very few times when when a cardiac patient would undergo anything like this, and 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 somebody would say, right, well, you know, carry on, good luck, you're fine. Um, you would either have to be sort of quite regularly checked up potentially every three months uh you know if you've had something like a, a cardiac arrest um or if you've just had fibrillation or something else um a little bit uh maybe less um less dangerous or or, or less serious uh, maybe your your cardiologist or your physician might say right come in every six months or, or 12 months or something like that um over and above all of that, uh, going back to the symptoms, a very, very easy thing to monitor is your heart rate. And obviously we've got very, you know, we've got loads and loads of ways to do that now. Just about every watch that comes out now has some kind of, if it's digital, has a heart rate monitor in some way, shape or form. Um, so that's, that's a really important thing to understand as well if you are going to try and get back to sport. Um, you, you, asked me, you asked me previously if, um, if there were any examples of high profile individuals having returned to sport after a cardiac incident. Um, now, there may well be people who've had stents and, um, you know, angioplasties and things like that. I, I assume a lot of them would have got back to sport, but something major like a cardiac arrest, I don't know of too many athletes. Uh, Fabrice Mwamba is a, is a very, very popular and famous case, well-known case. Um, he was a Premier League footballer who collapsed on the pitch uh, during a game between Bolton and Tottenham Hotspurs in 2012. Um, and he, unfortunately, he, he survived. Uh, very crazy story. His heart actually stopped beating for 78 minutes. Um, but he, 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 got, he got through it. Um, subsequently was advised not to, you know, that he couldn't play at that level of intensity again. Um, but he has done his coaching badges and all of that, and he's come back as a coach. So he's certainly able to participate still in football and he's coaching at a, at a junior level, but he's out on the field, he's kicking, he's jogging, he's, you know, he's busy. Um, so that's a good example of somebody who is able to get back to some function uh, or some of his function. Um, but then I thought this maybe was just an interesting, um, an interesting bit of statistics to, to add. Um, 
There's a study done by the Italian um, Olympic guys, the, the Olympic group, that uh, the medical group that supports the Italian Olympic team. And they found that 90, 92 Italian Olympics, Olympians rather, between the period of 20, 2004 and 2014. Now, obviously, these guys go, undergo regular cardiac screening, you know, as an athlete who, who, who's attending their um, camps and their academies. So... 92 Olympic athletes who had absolutely nothing wrong with them that picked up these cardiac abnormalities. Now, these weren't 16-year-olds trying out. They weren't, you know, guys who were climbing up through the ranks. These were guys at the peak who were sort of being screened for the Olympic system. Um, and there were only nine of them who were, who were effectively told, listen, this is a bad idea. You guys shouldn't, you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. Uh, so nine of them were removed. Seventeen were temporarily removed while they had while they, their situations were managed, either treated surgically or with medication. Um, and but the balance of them, sixty-six of them, actually just carried on. Uh, but again, advised advised on this whole monitoring process, you know, to frequently monitor their symptoms, uh, you know, constantly have their cardiac checkups and that. But that's sixty-six athletes at Olympic level who potentially have, you know, cardiac artery disease. Um, all sorts of other, you know, arrhythmias and things like that that we're all getting very concerned about. So it's a nice, it's a nice thing to see that people literally at the top of their game at the Olympics are still competing with this stuff. Um, <clears throat> okay, you'll, you'll, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's that's fine. Um, you, you, I'll, I'll hand over to you because I think you had a couple more questions. Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, there are two cases that uh, that I would like to mention. Uh, we, we I mean, there are there are hundreds of cases of heart patients who run. My own history is that of having run after a bypass surgery. We have got a lot of members in our training group called Zippers Club, which I run and I coach. And I coach heart patients who run after their uh, uh, you know cardiac incident. And we have all been running half marathons regularly. We may not be the fastest guys around the block, but we are still at it and going around and living very healthy lives and having yeah. a chest and People ask me, why do you call yourself zipper? And I say two reasons. One is, of course, the chest looks like a zip. Yeah, that's it. after the surgery. And the other thing is that we, you know, we are very positive. We got a very positive vibe, and therefore we are zipping through life. But <laughs> so, and I'm sure, I'm sure that you would be able to, you know, very good, um, I suppose, anecdotes. Correct. Getting back, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give two examples. Okay, so one example is. Uh, Dave McGivill Ray. Uh, Dave McGivill Ray is the race director of Boston Marathon for the last 32 years. He has been a very good coach, very good athlete, uh, conducts the Boston Marathon 32 years, runs a very leading, one of the world's biggest race directors of the most premier event in the world. You know, he's been there for 32 years doing that job. He had a cardiac bypass surgery about uh, three years back. And after the bypass surgery, he came back didn't skip. He runs the Boston Marathon. You know, after the event is flagged up and after the last runner has gone out, the race director runs the event. Okay. Exactly. So, so that's, yeah. So, and, but he has run. So, even after the bypass surgery, I think it was about four or five months after the underwent his uh, CABG, he ran the Boston Marathon again. So, so that is one, one, I mean, there are many ordinary cases, but this is some one large case. One very peculiar case is that of one Sir Ralph Fiennes. Okay. Sir Ralph Fiennes was an adventurer and very humorous British uh, nobleman, but with a keen sense of adventure, did funny things like, you know, North Pole and South Pole in the same year and stuff like that, you know. So one of the things is, of course, he started running and wanted to remain fit. And he underwent a bypass surgery. And after about three, four months of rehab, he decided that he needs to run full marathons. And he decided to run seven marathons in seven countries on seven consecutive days on seven wow. continents on seven consecutive days and this wow. didn't this didn't exist as an event okay now it's a package you pay some i think i think the price of the package is some thirty thousand dollars and it's like a tour it's like you know you get one plane and there about 30 40 people who paid 30 40 thousand dollars and they go continent to continent and run marathons every day okay so that's it that's commercialized but he was the guy who did it first that this is we are talking about 20 years back and he went to his cardiologist and he said that hey, I'm going to run full marathon. He said, hey, you just had a bypass surgery. He said, yeah, but I'm going to run full marathon. I'm already training. I've already done a 20 miler or whatever. And uh, so his cardiologist knew that he couldn't stop this guy. So 
So he said, okay, what do you do? Wear your heart rate monitor and don't go above 145. It was something. Like that. So this guy went, he ran the event. Uh, of course, uh, there have been questions and interesting sidelights about uh, how did this guy do it? I mean, how did he get seven uh, continents? So one is British Airways came in as a sponsor for the event. So they gave an aircraft for him. And then the, because he's from the royal family, the queen may give him some special status, which kind of entitled him to diplomatic uh, privileges. So he didn't have to go into visas and immigration. And when he landed the aircraft, you know, there was a kind of convoy to take him straight to the race, start, go to the start line, run the full marathon, come back in the car, come back to the aircraft, fly to the next continent. OK, <laughs> so that's the logistics of it, which you and I can only dream of. OK, so this guy ran seven uh, full marathons in seven continents on seven consecutive days. And he came back to his cardiologist after about a month. The cardiologist said, I hope you didn't run above 145. And this guy said, oh my god, I forgot to pack my heart rate monitor. I didn't run with my heart rate monitor. <laughs> so, so you know, yeah, there are just two funny stories. But but I like to share the stories to say that, you know, hey, you don't have to be afraid of it. If you if you, if you are cautious, if you if you are in good hands, uh, you might have had a heart disease, but you can lose your weight, get your weight back in life, get your chest back in life, take up running. It doesn't have to be full marathon. It doesn't have to be half marathons. 5Ks are okay, 10Ks are okay, but you know you can come back to running. So that's that's uh, that's really you know what I wanted to say. So Dr. Mm -hmm. Kalin, back to the next question. Okay, here's the average Joe, cardiac patient, whatever it is, deep fibrillation or anything, and uh, he comes to you and he says, hey, you know, Venkat Raman runs, so I also want to run or something like that. Okay, and uh, then what would you? What would be the kind of step that you would take him through, and how would you? you know mentor him counseling okay so taking okay. your taking your your two extreme examples aside um uh, i would always um i'd always want a cardiac patient to undergo the the cardiac prescription um mm. so, you know if your if your cardiologist or your physician says to you listen i want you in the program until you can achieve x you know, until you have whatever measurement or, or maybe they give you a time or whatever it is, it would be more than likely functionally based, not time based. You, you, you really should go through with that because the fact is it is your heart. And if something does go wrong, you know, it's potentially more serious than feeling a muscle. Mm. Um, wearing a heart rate monitor, I think, during training is, is non-negotiable. It's a very easy thing to do now. You know, it's not like it's sort of the early 90s where these things are cumbersome and, and, and a lot of fuss. It really is super easy to do now. Um, I would advise anyone with any kind of cardiac history to always train with a group uh, or at least one other person uh, to make sure that you, you're never alone in case something goes wrong. Um, always keep some kind of communication handy. So these days, cell phones, everyone has them. They don't necessarily run with them, but at least somebody in the group should have a phone. Um, keep your personal details and medical history on you. Uh, so, you know, the, the whole, the, the traditional old allergy bracelets, if you're somebody with cardiac history, potentially keeping that on your person somehow. Um, back to the symptoms, you have to monitor your symptoms during any exercise time and at least for 24 hours afterwards. This is the important thing, is that it's not just during the exercise where, you know, things might start to go amiss. You need to you need to monitor monitor for at least 24 hours afterwards um and then any abnormal symptoms need to be reported uh, there's no point in monitoring your symptoms and then going home and thinking oh jeepers that was quite hard you know i felt really really fatigued didn't feel great today and then just keeping it to yourself uh, the point of doing that is so that you can you know uh, the way that medicine is now is, is we're all available on WhatsApp and, you know, people can send messages and emails and all sorts of things to their GPs or their cardiologists or whatever uh, very easily. So just get on the phone or get on the on the email and just, you know, send something with your symptoms, send an explanation, ask the questions, get the information before you decide to just sort of carry on, you know, sticking your head in the sand. Um, don't exercise if you feel any abnormal symptoms. Obviously, uh, that should go without saying. Um, so if somebody wakes up and they feel like, mm, they actually don't feel that great that day, definitely not a good idea to exercise. This probably goes for most people, but certainly if you've got a cardiac history, that would be an, uh, something to look out for. And then obviously, if you do feel any kind of symptom during activity, um, any abnormal symptoms, 
um, you should stop exercising. Uh, you know, it's it's probably not you know something like if you're a runner and you've got a history of Achilles injuries and you you feel your Achilles is starting to sort of bother you a little bit on a run. That's probably not anything to do with any kind of cardiac issue. Uh, what I mean is more sort of systemic things. So any kind of new or abnormal symptom like the symptoms we discussed previously. Um, but I've, I've, got a, I've got another slide. If you just want to click across, so we can just run through um, a couple of them. So any kind of chest pain or tightness, um, shortness of breath that's disproportionate to what you're doing. Obviously, if you're active, you should have some relative amount of shortness of breath. Um, fainting or dizziness, any kind of lightheadedness. Uh, fatigue. Again, any kind of fatigue that's disproportionate to what you're doing. Of course, if you're exercising, you might feel a little bit fatigued. But if it's abnormal, that's an abnormal symptom. Uh, arm, jaw, pain between your shoulder blades at the back. Those have also been reported. Um, nausea, abnormal rhythms in your heart. If you can feel your heart beating out of your chest, if you can see your heart rate at one point is 57 and then it goes up to 143, and then it, you know that's also another issue. Um, and then any new or different symptom, as I mentioned, anything that's abnormal, really, you know, you should be a little bit more alert, a little bit of heightened sort of sensitivity to those kind of things than your average person who doesn't have a cardiac history. Um, and then going on, just talking about tests, um, you know, that you could that you could do before resuming running. Um, so. You know, your, your, your question was along the lines of what precautions should people take. Um, I think cardiac rehab, any cardiac rehab would always involve physical stress tests. Uh, so whether that's a six minute walk test, that's very early days in hospital rehab, you know, seeing how far you can walk in six minutes. Um, something like a repeated sit to stand. That's also a very early day test. And once you start to graduate out of the program, you might look at something like a, a treadmill stress test with an ECG, uh, where you might be sitting there telling someone like myself or a, or an exercise physiologist, um, you know, what your RPE is. Uh, so the RPE, um, I would assume most people would know about, but just quickly running through it. Effectively, if you're, uh, so a guy by the name of Borg came up with the scale, it's, it's Borg's uh, rate of perceived exertion, RPE is rate of perceived exertion. So the whole thing, the whole idea is that it's subjective. It's not about me telling you, you know, what you feel or what you should, the parameters you should work within. It's about you telling me how you feel. And instead of worrying about heart rate, uh, Borg noticed that your average person just basically milling about, doing activities of daily living, walking around the house, lifting the odd thing, cleaning the house. Their, their heart rates didn't really go below 60. It was like 60 to 90. And up to maximum heart rate, predominantly around about you know, 180, 190, 200. So he, he chopped off the, the, the last, you know, the zeros, and he, he created a scale from 6 to 20. Instead of six, 60 to 200, he, he took 6 to 20. And 6 is, is entry level. It's like very basic. How do you feel? Yeah, I feel like I'm you know, walking around. Nothing. And then 20 is like your absolute max that you could possibly push yourself. So it takes a while to get used to it. Um, but that would also be a, a, one of the purposes of, of going through the cardiac rehab is to, be, is, to, is to start to understand and become more familiar with these, these reporting mechanisms so that you can understand how you actually feel. Um, so those would be what you would need to do before you go back to resuming running. You'd have to get checked out properly and you'd likely go through with those and if not a couple of other tests. Um, and then once your rehab is complete and once you feel like you, you know, you're back and you want to get back into proper training, it's always a good idea to have a VO2 max test done. It's certainly not mandatory. Um, you know, it's, it's more about performance. It's about finding out how you use your energy sources, your fuel sources. Um, it's about uh, how much oxygen you are able to deliver to your cells um, at, at the peak of your, your exercise. And that's, that to an extent can be trained. And certainly if you're coming out of a rehab situation or a period of inactivity, you should be able to, to you know, vastly improve your VO2 max. Uh, guys at the top of, the, at the top of their, their game, like 
uh, guys actively, you know, running professionally, their VO2 max doesn't really fluctuate much. You know, they can't train it. There's, there's, there's sort of a physiological VO2 max that they were blessed with, and they, they live there. But if you aren't particularly fit, you might find, I'll take myself as an example, um, if I'm fit, my VO2 max is probably around 62, 63. If I'm unfit, it might be, you know, closer to 50. Um, so it is something that can be trained, or we can use it as a guideline of how to train you. <coughs> Thank you, Doctor. Um, uh, yes, you know, this, this somebody who's undergone a cardiac incident, wants to come back to running, start with a rehab, talk test, sit up and down test, the uh, you know, one minute mile test or whatever, I mean, all the all the existing protocols. Uh, many, many are from smaller cities and uh, an ECG would often be uh, suitable. Again, question is whether till failure or till uh, maximum heart rate testing protocol, those, those come into picture. VO2 max comes into picture. But, but let's take another scenario. There is this guy who's already been running. Typically, he's been training with somebody, he's had a cardiac incident. Or he's a patient with some comorbidities, didn't have a cardiac incident, has gone into uh, hibernation because of lockdown, uh, didn't feel like running around the house and completing a marathon from his bedroom to his living room, as some crazy people have been doing, or didn't Absolutely. want to get into the step up challenges or running in the compound of his building. And uh, he yeah. just didn't like it, you know. So he just stayed at home and maybe put on a little bit of what is euphemistically called now quarantine weight. <laughs> okay, and he wants to come back, and uh, he is either a heart patient or at risk. So one would, of course, uh, be the stress test. But what are the other kind of tests that you would recommend? How do you? How does a trainer, and this is especially a trainer who has a um, trainee coming like this with this kind of a background, what precautionary steps should a trainer take and tell the trainee to take so that you know there is no risk uh, while there is training going? Yeah. So I think, look, again, the, the, the answer as always is it depends. It depends on a number of things. So what level is the is the individual coming from? What sort of base have they got? Or what sort mm. of base did they have in February, March before everything mm. locked down? What is their mm. previous years of experience running? And where do they want to get to? You know, the person who wants to get back to running up and down Marine Drive, you know, three Ks, maybe three times a week. Is, is a very different expectation, a different process to somebody who wants to get back to running 60, 70 Ks a week. Um, so everything, all of this stuff really does need to be individualized. Um, from a trainer's point of view, I would advise never pushing anyone uh, more than they're comfortable doing. Um, the old traditional, you know, don't improve, don't increase by more than 10%. In fact, now we know that it's probably closer to up to 22% is probably the, the highest percentage that that's been shown is relatively safe. So anything between 10 and 22%, whether it's time on the road or mileage. Um, so th those are sort of the, the things to do. But before they even get out onto the road, like you said, people potentially have been sitting around doing nothing. So are they actually even... Are they, are they healthy enough to start running? Are they potentially going to cause themselves some kind of injury? Now, we know for most people, they probably will be fine, uh, you know, getting out and just as long as they start very slowly. But the problem is that nobody likes to run, nobody likes to start slowly. And runners specifically, who are a completely mad bunch, never want to start slowly. So every runner I see now is coming to me saying that, oh, but you know, last year I was running X, Y, and Z. Literally last year means nothing, it means nothing whatsoever. It, you know, especially after this lockdown, last year means nothing. So what were you doing during lockdown? Were you doing a lot of HIIT stuff? Were you doing boot camp stuff? Were you doing very little and just spending time with your family and enjoying the fact that you didn't have to sit in traffic for four hours a day? Um, so I would suggest if somebody is getting, is planning on getting back into any kind of structured or organized training for any kind of event, like, you know, there's a 21K coming up or, or my running group is starting again and our running coach wants us to be able to do X, Y, and Z by whatever date, then I would suggest a basic physical assessment and a basic screening is a good idea to see where people are, what are their baselines, what do their calves look like? What do their quads look like? Their glutes look like? Are they weak? Um, is there anything, any any sort of random funny issues crept in 
during this period of, of, of you know, highly sedentary behavior, um, comparative highly sedentary behavior. Um, and then potentially something like a stress test with an ECG if we're talking about a patient with a medical history. Uh, that that wouldn't be relevant for um, for most people, but somebody with a medical history potentially you might want to do a treadmill test with a with a or stress test with an ECG, um, and then a VO2 max again. That's the other end of the scale. If we're looking at the guys, you know, you might have a number of guys in your group who are who are at the performance end, the guys who are really trying to you know push themselves as hard as they can, as as fast as they can, whatever. Who, who don't have a medical history. Um, so those guys potentially might might uh, benefit from doing a VO2 max test and understanding where their baseline is, understanding what their use of fuel is so that we can guide them from a program point of view or maybe you know um, chat to the coaches about what the sort of program looks like going forward. Um, and then just during activity, that RPE, as I mentioned, um, and then you mentioned the talk test. Uh, that's super, super important, you know, particularly when we're when we're talking about anyone with any kind of medical history is, you know, no huffing and puffing when you get back on the road. It must be comfortable. It really, really has to be comfortable. Slow and steady is the best for every athlete, but it's imperative for anyone with a medical history. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, just, just uh, I'll share my own experience. Uh, we decided to get a uh, 2D stress echo done for all our athletes. That was one. And uh, and uh, we decided to get all the blood checkups and the typical blood work. Okay. So uh, based on considerable advice that came to us, uh, the stress 2D echo, of course, we, we have always been doing it every year. Uh, ever since we started the group, once a year we have been doing. So we decided that before we start training, we will do the stress 2D echo. And we found that uh, your hospital is not taking any OPD patients. So we couldn't get in there and get the test done. Asian Heart, which is the other facility, is not doing it. So for those who are part of the audience and who are in Bombay, uh, we, we found that Jupiter Hospital in Tane is willing to do the stress to echo on OPD basis. So a lot of my trainees have gone and started getting their uh, uh, stress to echo done there. And the idea was to see if there are any abnormalities, if there are any spikes, if there are any positives uh, that are coming out of uh, that. And and that, so we are comparing that with the earlier years report and going on that. In terms of blood work, of course, the cholesterol, sugar, kidney, all the stuff, vitamin D, B12, which kind of becoming like a once in a year mandatory test. We debated a lot about uh, whether to test for coronavirus, positive antigen, PTC, what are you know, all those different variations that exist. And then we decided that as long as if you are symptom free, there is no need to go and get a test done just for the sake of intellectual curiosity of getting the test done. So, so that's what we did. And that's where uh, uh, that, that, that's what we, we felt was a good advice going forward. Of course, in the group, uh, uh, we never uh, push very much uh, our, our hill training. Uh, uh, you know, uh, intense runs are very limited just for about a month or so because most are in the aged category. Uh, high stress uh, training can result in injuries. So, mostly toward the year, it's base building, cardiac, marathon based runs, half, you know, uh, top test kind of training. And that's what we are for. We are not here to win a podium finish. We are not, I mean, everybody tries to better his performance, but if it doesn't get it, he doesn't care. Okay, so yeah. that, that's where we are. So, so coming to uh, blood test, is there any specific blood work that you would recommend for somebody who's coming back into running after COVID and after you know is comorbid and you know maybe you should check something more than the treadmill test? Sorry, then that you broke up there. Do you mind just asking that again? Okay, sorry. So, so the question is that. Besides the treadmill test, is there something that you would think we should do uh, in terms of That's blood work? Yeah. No, and, and to be honest, I wouldn't be the right person to advise you on that. Um, okay. I would say speak to your speak to your GP, speak to um, you know a, a physician, a med medical physician, uh, or a cardiologist, and they might be the right person to 
um, to advise you on that. But again, I don't think that would be very relevant, in my opinion, um, in the general population, getting blood tests before deciding whether you can run. Um, people with a medical history, um, and, and if they have been symptomatic, I would assume that there probably would be a, um, there, would, there might be some blood work warranted. Uh, but again, not, not my area of expertise, I'm afraid. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, <clears throat> coming back, uh, there are some questions, and there is one specific question that says, is there a reason, Deepak Pai is asking, is there a reason why we see athletes who suffer from heart issues during marathon, half marathon, face the issues towards the end of the run? Uh, uh, that is when they finish or after they just finish their marathon, half marathon. And doctor, as you probably know, about 80 to 90 percent of the incidences that happen, happen at the finish line or just before the finish line. And uh, is there a, I mean, what is the physiological reason for this? I'm not sure, actually, is the, is the easy, the short answer. Um, I would assume it would have to do something. It would have to have something to do with um, your your relaxation of your vessels um, and maybe just a, a drop in blood pressure. Or um, you know, I don't know. Actually, it's if if we go back to that example I gave you about uh, that footballer collapsing, that was in mm. like the seventeenth minute or something. Mm. So that wasn't that wasn't related to fatigue. Um, that was related to um, a cardiomyopathy that, that athletes have, an athlete's heart, supposedly. Mm. Um, mm. And I, I have read about a number of athletes who sort of are, you know, at you know mile, mile marker 19 or mile marker 20 or, or that kind of thing. Um, so I, I don't know, actually, to be honest. Um, maybe speak to Ashish about that. He, he might be a mm. good person to maybe, you know, I don't know, do a post for you guys for your blog or something along those lines. I'm, I'm not sure. Sorry. Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, this, but but um, most findings are that there's already an underlying level of uh, stress that has load, been loaded in those 25 miles or uh, for 12, 12 miles. And then everybody's trying to push it uh, in the last kilometer, last mile. To the finish line and trying to get his PB. So already on a base of uh, load, you are increasing the load, and that is where all the positives start showing up. <laughs> sure. and, uh, that sounds plausible. Sounds plausible, definitely. Hmm. So so that is that is that is one uh, one one possible reason from my particular readings, uh, <clears throat> Doctor. Uh, uh, There is this considerable debate about uh, whether the Bruce Protocol treadmill test should be done as per Bruce Protocol till maximum heart rate, age, you know, derived maximum heart rate, mm. or the whether in the case of an athlete, one should go till failure. So, so what what are your views? I mean, uh, should one stick to the safe method of 100% MHR and you're done with it? Or should one keep pushing past 100% MHR Go to one ten or one fifteen or whatever, and still see when his spike show. Yeah, look, if you can get to one fifteen, you're pretty impressive. Um, okay, but, but no, I I think I think it needs to be personally a, a maximum heart rate test. Um, you know the that that very generic calculation of you know two twenty minus your age, um, or even if you take the Carvenon method, they aren't mm. actual they aren't actually maximum heart rates measurements, the mm. estimates. Um, so if you are, if you're working in an elite setting, you definitely do want to know what your, what your athlete's maximum heart rate is. Um, mm. If we're talking about patients with a medical history, um, I don't know that there would be value in, in pushing someone to that level when you can just, you know, get an estimate from doing a calculation. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think that it necessarily would be valuable in, in, in the general population, certainly not people with medical uh, background or medical histories, um, but in, in an elite athlete population, yeah, you would definitely want to know what the actual max heart rate is, measured maximum heart rate. 
very good so doctor are there any last points from you we are we are just kind of ready to close are there any questions from the audience i can't see anything uh, let me just see if there are any more questions um i don't have anything really else to add but i, I suppose the only thing i'd like to reiterate is is how um you know nowadays everybody wants um a broad sweeping quick simple fix for for everything um and i think particularly with your health and then going you know narrowing in even more to your cardiovascular system and your heart um it's really really important that people understand that you, you can't just you know follow guidelines you know these sort of like random guidelines that you find in runner's world or something um it, it's 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 quite a serious situation uh, not to scare anyone but if you if you do want to get back safely to what you want to do it needs to be a personalized approach you need to get assessed you need to make sure that you have clearance from the right people um and then you need to go slowly you really do need to constantly monitor yourself you need to go slowly through the process and you need to be patient um because you know things can things can certainly go wrong and if um yeah it can go very wrong doctor is another question from manohar if a person doesn't use a heart rate monitor <coughs> what is the best way of going about monitoring one's heart rate um well while you're active i don't think you can um obviously a heart rate at rest is easy enough to to measure if you just take your pulse where's my camera take your radio pulse there and you can take it for 10 seconds and multiply that number by 6 to give you a, a, a basic of your resting heart rate um if you then want to try and use that carbon and method uh, to work out what your um maximum heart rate could be um you can do that um but yeah i don't know of any certainly not better than a, a, a heart rate monitor or a, a wrist watch and those wrist watches have been shown to be very accurate actually um they're not they're not a hundred percent but they're like you know 98 99 accurate so they're a very good way of telling what your heart rate is yes uh and and we seem to forget that uh, that uh until about a few years back almost the entire world olympic records everything was broken with our heart rate monitors i mean exactly. <laughs> yeah everybody just did this when they stopped running <laughs> you know no, so, uh, could almost see every athlete doing this with the stop running to see what their heart rate was and writing it down somewhere but but now we have all this technology and we think that without the technology we just cannot run yeah no so you can of course you can and and, and it, but it's it's a convenience um you know if you're asking what is the best way to measure your heart rate it's with the heart rate monitor without a doubt if you're asking mm. is it imperative to measure your heart rate no if you have a cardiac history i would say the opportunity is there why not have a heart rate monitor with you you know if you do have a history of arrhythmias or abnormal beats or something of course why not do it you know for the price of i don't know a couple of thousand rupees you can get an entry level wrist watch that that tells you your heart rate i think it's a pretty reasonable investment um but is it imperative for everyone to know their heart rate god no i i hardly ever train with i never train actually with a with a heart rate monitor on. I can but I don't use it. Excellent. So doctor uh, you know before we wind up personal question how much do you run? What's that? How much do you run? Currently not much at all unfortunately. Uh, this <laughs> year has been this year has been terrible for me. Um I think probably the the most I've been running I don't know last year I think at one stage I was up to about 50 i think i was up to about 50 k's a week 40 or 50 k's a week at a push um but yeah i haven't run i haven't run at all since pretty much february uh you know the occasional little little run here and there but certainly nothing that's worth mentioning okay take it so any final words before we close up doctor no i'm good thank you very much for having me uh, venkat it was lovely to chat and and i hope that 
whoever was listening and watching got a little bit of something out of it. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, uh, uh, Manohar. Thanks, Deepak, for asking the question. Thanks, Prashant, for being online and uh, and being there. Thank you, everybody. And, you know, Happy New Year. I hope that 2021 is not the same as 2020. <laughs> I think I think we got such a low benchmark in 2020 that anything that happens in 2021 is going to be better than 2020. It can be worse than that kind of situation. <laughs> and I, I wish you a happy year. I just want a boring 2021. Hmm? I know. And uh, and I hope that uh, and you, you remain healthy. I hope you get back to running. I hope that you stay fit. And uh, I mean, it has been a very, very strong lesson that health is wealth. And uh, I know many of my close friends who have passed away because of COVID and only because they didn't take care of their health. OK, so stay healthy, stay strong. Uh, Happy New Year. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much.